Here, let's do chewing. Here's a head. Oh god, this I should have planned this out. Uh, here's the mouth. Okay, and it's chewing. <laughs> So this time we're talking about a rather short reading by Bernard Williams. It's a reading about relativism. But before we get to the reading, we need a distinction between two different views that might get confused with one another. One view about, uh, well, moral truths or morality itself, we could call anti-realism is the view that a certain thing is not real, that there aren't any of that thing. So anti-realism about morality is the claim that there's no such thing as morality. There are no moral truths, there are no moral facts, there are no moral properties, nothing is right or wrong or good or bad in the moral sense. That's anti-realism. It's the claim that something isn't real. That is different from what we might call relativism is the view that something is real, it's just relative to something. That is, it changes based on context, for example. Okay, let me try to explain this distinction with an example. Say that we're talking about etiquette. Say that there is a rule of etiquette or a fact of etiquette that you're not supposed to chew with your mouth open. Okay. If, if, if chewing with your mouth open, here, let's do chewing. Here's a head. Oh God, this, I should have planned this out. Uh, here's the mouth. Okay. And it's chewing and there's some food coming out. Okay. Chewing with the mouth open. There's the eye. All right. Chewing with your mouth open. This is said to be rude. If you're a relativist about rudeness facts or about etiquette facts, then you think that, well, some types of behavior really are rude. It's just that whether they are or aren't is relative to the society in, that we're talking about or the culture that we're talking about, right? So a relativist about etiquette or rudeness facts says that etiquette is real, some things really are rude, it's just that what makes them rude is in part where they're happening. That's relativism. Anti-realism about etiquette or rudeness facts is the view that there's no such thing as etiquette. That chewing with your mouth open is not rude, but it's not polite either. Nothing is rude or nothing is polite. That's anti-realism. There's no such thing as, say, etiquette versus there is such a thing as etiquette, it just changes from one society to another. When it comes to etiquette, relativism is very plausible. Whereas anti-realism, well, anti-realism is somewhat more implausible. Like, it, it sure seems like some things really are rude. Like chewing with your mouth open. That really is rude. That's just true. It's just that what makes it true are certain facts about the society in which it's occurring. Okay, so we've got this distinction between anti-realism and relativism. Last time, we got an argument that we sort of drew out of the work of David Hume that got us to maybe a kind of anti-realist conclusion about morality. Today, we're talking about Williams, and Williams is not talking about a view that denies that morality is real. He's talking about a view on which morality is relative. It's real, it's just that it's different from one place to another. So in specific, Williams is talking about a certain kind of relativism that he has a name for. This name, this name for it, this is a pejorative name. He's making fun of it. It's derogatory. He's saying that this view is vulgar. It's a sort of overly, well, I don't even know what vulgar means, but it's sure not good. Okay, so we've got this pejorative name for this view. Vulgar relativism, as he defines it, is actually very complicated. It's got three components or three steps. One of them is linguistic. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty difficult to pull out of the text that we read. 
So we're going to work with a sort of simplified version of this view. The simplified version of vulgar relativism consists of two theses or two claims. The first claim is what we're just going to call relativism. And this version of relativism says the following. That's relativism as we are defining it here. This isn't in the Williams reading. This is a sort of simplified version. It's the claim that what is morally right or wrong can only be coherently understood as relative to the accepted moral code of a society. Notice the following about relativism. It is not the claim that different groups of people in different places, in different societies, disagree about what's right or wrong. That's not what this is saying. Everyone says that. Everyone says that different groups of people uh, have different views about what's morally right or wrong. That's uncontroversial. I've never met someone who denies that. Of course that's true. Of course, in some places they think certain things are morally acceptable, and in other places they think other things are morally acceptable. There were certain periods of time in certain parts of Asia, right, where um, foot binding was not only a common practice, foot binding is where the, the feet of young girls are wrapped very tight at a young age, and they're kept wrapped so that the feet can't grow. It's very painful. Um, it causes all sorts of medical problems, um, and ultimately, it seems to many like it's fundamentally a form of oppression or subjugation, of course, right? So there are some places where that was not only common, but that was thought to be morally acceptable. It's not just that it happened, it's that everyone thought that it was fine that it happened or good that it happened. But there are other societies where they think that that sort of practice is inhumane or evil or wrong. So there's definitely moral disagreement between different societies. Relativism is the claim that every society is correct. Every moral code of every society is right. It's just right for that society. That's relativism. Okay, so vulgar relativism is made up of relativism and one more claim. So the second claim we're going to call toleration. It's the claim that it is wrong for people in one society to condemn or interfere with another society. So we've got these two claims, relativism and toleration. Notice something about these. They're very different types of claims. Toleration is a specific moral principle. It's talking about a specific kind of action the condemnation or interference with another society or the members of another society or something like that, right? This, this claim is like the claim that murder is wrong or that torturing kittens is wrong or that foot binding is wrong, right? This just says that a certain type of behavior is wrong. It's a rather specific claim in that sense. Relativism is a claim about the nature of moral truth in general. It's not a claim about some specific type of behavior and whether it's right or wrong. It's a claim about rightness or wrongness facts in general. It says that these kinds of facts can only be understood as relative to different societies. There are only moral truths for specific societies that apply to those specific societies. That's relativism. Okay, so these are two actually very different kinds of claims. But vulgar relativism is the name for the view that combines them, holds them both at the same time. Or, even more than that, it's the view that takes this first one to sort of lead to this second one. It's somehow that you start with the idea, there's something very natural about this actually, you start with the idea that, well, different societies have different moral values and their values are right for them, and therefore, it follows from that, in some sense, that we shouldn't interfere with the practices of one another. We should tolerate each other because, well, after all, as it were, what they're doing is right for them. Okay, vulgar relativism is the combination of these two. These are both very attractive uh, individually. Like, you might be tempted towards either of these. When I teach this material to, you know, first or second year undergraduates, um, all the time, and I take a little poll in class, both of these are popular. Relativism is popular. Relativism, I'm getting something like typically 
80 to 90% of the students raise their hands as supporting relativism. And toleration, I'm also getting a significant number, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% of the students seem to be, well, sympathetic to toleration at least the first time you introduce these views to them and explain exactly what they are. Williams is making the following potentially counterintuitive claim. The claim is that vulgar relativism, which is the combination of relativism and toleration, is incoherent. These two views cannot be held together. They are mutually incompatible. If one of them is true, then the other one can't be true. That's Williams's claim. Here's one way to put the claim. Relativism and toleration are incompatible because toleration is attempting to be or is supposed to be a non-relative principle. Think about it like this. The claim that it's wrong for a society or the members of a certain society to, say, interfere with the behavior of another society. You know, they see that some group, some other group is doing something, they think that it's wrong, and they step in to stop it. That's a kind of violation of toleration, right? That's an intolerant act. Is that wrong? If it is wrong, is it wrong for everyone everywhere? Is it wrong for every society or the members of every society to do that sort of thing? If so, then toleration is a non-relative, universal, moral principle. Remember, this is just a specific moral claim. It's a claim about the rightness or wrongness of a specific type of action. It says that that type of action, right, the condemning and the interfering, that type of action is wrong. Well, if this is a, is a universal moral principle, and if it's true, then there's at least one non-relative, universal, moral principle. So relativism is false. Relativism says that what is morally right and wrong can only be coherently understood as relative to the accepted moral code of a society. That is, that there are no universal moral truths or universal moral principles. Toleration looks just like an example of one of those, if we accept it. So you can't have both of these at the same time. If all moral truths are relative, then, well, there can't be this one universal non-relative moral truth. And if there is this one universal non-relative moral truth, then, well, relativism is false because not all moral claims are relative. So at this point, the vulgar relativist might try to evade this objection. The vulgar relativist might try to change her view so that there's no longer a conflict between these two. The way to do that, the sort of obvious way to do that, would be to just say that toleration is, well, itself a relative principle, right? Something like, oh yes, yes, I'm a relativist. I think that different societies have different moral codes and all of those societies are correct when it comes to their own behavior, and that also it's wrong for people of one society to condemn or interfere with another society, but actually that's only true of me and the other members of my society. Well, that's coherent. You could have both of those. You could have a relative version of toleration that applies to just one society and relativism and hold them together. Except, well, that's not as good as what we wanted. It seems like what was attractive about toleration, if anything was, was the idea that like everybody had to go back to their own corners and, well, not condemn or interfere with anyone else. If there's just one group for whom it's wrong to interfere, well, then first of all, they're going to be uh, abused or attacked by the other groups, right, for whom it isn't wrong. Um, and also, we just sort of don't get the sort of the general grand applicability um, that we thought we had to start. So there's another option, actually. The vulgar relativist can try another move. She can say something like, okay, 
So relativism is true, so there are no universal moral principles, no universal moral truths, but this principle, this moral truth, it is relative, it's just that there's a lot of them. There's a ton of them. They look like this and they apply to all different societies. So this version of the moral relativist might list off all the different societies all the way until you get to the last society, society N. We've listed every single society now. And it just so happens for every single one, there's a moral principle like toleration that applies to them. T, 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 they're all tolerant. That will actually get you something like the result that the vulgar relativist wanted in the first place, right? It'll get you the result that, well, every society has their own moral code and their moral code is right for them. And it's also true that it's wrong for anyone everywhere to interfere. But it's wrong not because there's some universal moral principle, but because there's a whole bunch of non-universal moral principles. And they just all coincide on this particular matter. These societies might all disagree about a whole bunch of different other stuff, says this version of the vulgar relativist. Right? But still, they agree about toleration. Well, what's wrong with this? Well, the problem with this view, most directly, is that it's obviously false. The claim that every society includes some kind of toleration principle within its moral code is just obviously false. Not all societies are tolerant. Go ahead, try to think of an intolerant society one that holds that it's okay to condemn or interfere with another society. Think of an example. Or try to think of a society that is tolerant. Try to think of one that does hold a principle like this. You might be totally unable to do that. I'm struggling to do it right now. Are there any societies that are tolerant? So this move of getting a moral principle like toleration by, by just claiming you know, that as it so happens, every society holds their own relative version of this toleration principle. That's just wildly implausible. Okay, let's go through a bit of the text to pull out the sorts of things that Williams is saying. Okay. This is something that Williams says. The central confusion of relativism is to try to conjure out of the fact that societies have differing attitudes and values an a priori non-relative principle to determine the attitude of one society to another. This is impossible. Okay, uh, what does that mean? Let's go through it really slowly. The central confusion of relativism. Okay, and here he means vulgar relativism. So this is going to be the mistake. He's going to be explaining the mistake that the vulgar relativist is making. The central confusion of relativism is to try to conjure, all right, conjure, that's like a word from magic talk, right? And he's being snarky here, right? This is derogatory, right? If you're trying to conjure something, you're trying to magically make something appear. And then the thought is like, no, that won't appear. You can't make that appear, right? So the mistake is that they try to make something appear from something else. And you can't make that thing appear, right? You can't really make a rabbit just appear out of thin air. And so too, you can't make something out of something else. Let's see. The central confusion of relativism is to try to conjure out of the fact that societies have differing attitudes and values. Okay, that's the thing that the conjuring is happening from, right? So, okay, we've got some conjuring some supposed or attempted conjuring. It's coming from here and you try to take from, you try to make this, take this and make something out of it, right? Okay, um, you try to take the fact that societies have differing attitudes and values. So we'll just call that moral disagreement. Moral disagreement between societies. That's just a fact everyone agrees that societies disagree about moral matters. Okay, so the mistake of relativism is to try to start from here and get from this to something else. To what? Try to get 
an a priori non-relative principle to determine the attitude of one society to another. Uh, okay, what does that mean? Let's start with a priori. That's Latin. It's a Latin phrase that means prior to, specifically in this context, it's a philosophical term that means prior to experience or sensory experience. Think about it like this. You may remember from the very first lecture in this course, I talked about triangles. We said something about triangles, right? Do you remember what I said about triangles? Or what we discovered? What was sort of obvious about triangles once you realize it? Triangles don't exist, right? Or at least there isn't one right here. If they exist, they don't exist in the world around you, right? This is not a triangle. This, of course, is some markers uh, written, like some, some bits of marker ink on a piece of glass, right? That's what this is. This is not a triangle, right? Marker uh, ink is made up of atoms, like everything. Everything is made up of atoms, right? So atoms, of course, are three-dimensional objects. A triangle is a two-dimensional polygon. So whatever, whatever this is, it's made of three-dimensional objects. It's three-dimensional. It's not a polygon. It's not a two-dimensional um, uh, shape, right? Okay, this is not a triangle. A triangle is a two-dimensional sort of abstract entity that we thought up, right? But nonetheless, we know some real things about triangles. We know some real, true, cold, hard triangle facts, folks, like triangles are made of three sides, or that the interior angles of a triangle sum to 180 degrees. That's a fact. That's a cold, hard, geometrical fact, folks. You can't, if you think that the interior angles of a triangle are anything other than 180 degrees in sum, you are confused about triangles. You don't know the facts. So this is a fact about triangles. What kind of a fact is it? Is it a fact that we learn by looking at triangles? By looking at them when teachers draw them on the board and measuring them with, a, with something, with a little tool, with a little compass or something like that? No, that's not the kind of fact it is. Because we don't measure triangles. You can't measure triangles because this isn't a triangle, right? You can't gather up triangles and put them in cages in a laboratory and experiment on them. That's not how we know the things we know about triangles. We don't know it by looking at them or smelling them or licking the triangles or listening really carefully when they talk. We don't know anything we know about triangles from our senses. That's not how we know things about triangles. Whatever we know about triangles, and we do know some stuff, we know prior to sense experience, prior to experiencing a triangle if we ever could. Whatever we know about triangles, we know those things a priori, without going and observing, without checking with our senses. I mean, the truth is we know these facts about triangles by just stipulating the definition of a triangle and then thinking really, really hard and really, really clearly about what triangles must be like given their definition, given their stipulated definition. That's how we know that the interior angle sum to 180 degrees, we just defined what a triangle was and then did some proofs, which is just thinking really, really clearly. No sense perception of triangles involved. So everything that we know about triangles is a priori. It's without observation, without observing. It's just by thinking really clearly. Okay, that's what a priori means. It means a, a claim or a principle or a bit of knowledge is a priori if it is known or maybe can be known without experience, like the way we know stuff about triangles. Non-relative, the next word in this little passage is non-relative. Non-relative means general, universal, applies everywhere. Here's what this is saying. This is saying, this quote is saying that the mistake that relativism is making is to try to go from the fact that there are moral disagreements between societies or among societies, right? The mistake is trying to go from that to, well, some general principle that's non-relative and that we know, <clears throat> some general principle that's non-relative and that we know without checking, without observing, without going and watching the practices of every different society. 
a priori in the sense that we don't go and check, we don't observe, we don't check with our senses, our eyes or our ears or our noses or whatever, right? What this is saying is that you can't get toleration, some general non-relative principle that you can somehow find out without going and checking the, all the specific societies, you can't get that from just the mere fact that there exist moral disagreements. The central confusion of relativism is to try to conjure out of the fact that societies have differing attitudes and values, to try to conjure out of that an a priori non-relative principle to determine the attitude of one society to another, to determine how one society should act towards another society or think towards another society. Trying to do this, this move, trying to conjure this from this is impossible. That's what Williams is saying here. But there's more. He says more than this. Let's see what else he says. He says, if we are going to say that there are ultimate moral disagreements between societies, we must include in the matters they can disagree about their attitudes to other moral outlooks. Right? The idea is that if we think there are moral disagreements, right, which is part of relativism, relativism is the claim that there are moral disagreements and that, well, everyone is right. If we are going to say that there are ultimate moral disagreements between societies, we must include in the matters that they can disagree about, we have to include in the, well, in the topics that they disagree about, their attitudes to other moral outlooks. That is, whether or not a society is morally permitted to condemn or interfere with another society, that's one of the moral claims that societies can themselves disagree about. That is, some societies are going to be tolerant and others are going to be intolerant. That's just another moral disagreement. If there's going to be moral disagreements, then there's got to also be moral disagreement about, well, moral disagreement. And if there can be that kind of moral disagreement, right, then there are going to be some societies that are intolerant. And those societies are going to be correct. That's what relativism says. If you're a relativist, then those intolerant societies are correct. Think of your favorite intolerant society, right? Some society of people where they think it's okay to say that some other society is evil or wrong. You probably are a member of an intolerant society. And not only that, you are probably yourself intolerant. That is, you think that there are some practices that exist somewhere in the world that are morally abhorrent and that are wrong, even for them doing it over there. You probably think that. If that's the case, right, and if relativism is true, then, well, you're correct. You and your society, your intolerant society is correct. And so therefore, at least some cases of intolerance, according to the relativist, are acceptable. This is how you can really show that relativism and toleration are mutually incompatible. You can derive a straightforward contradiction from them. Here's how you do that. Ready? Let's say you hold that relativism is true and you add to that the existence of just one intolerant society. This is a society that thinks it's morally okay to interfere with other societies, right? I mean, I really think that almost all societies are like this, but we just need one for this to work. So pick your favorite intolerant society. From those two things, we get the following. They say that it's right to interfere. That's what makes them an intolerant society, right? They say that it's right for them to interfere with the goings-ons of other societies. You add relativism to that, and that means that they're correct. Relativism says that, well, all of these different societies, their own values are correct. So they say that interfering is good, and they're right about it. So therefore, it is right for them to interfere. Okay, well, 
Well, that's just a straightforward contradiction, folks, right? Either it's right or it's wrong. Toleration says that it's wrong. Relativism plus some very straightforward, uncontroversial claim, the existence of an intolerant society, says that it's right. So this is at least one way to get a certain kind of contradiction between these two claims. All right, that's it. That's all we have to say about Williams, at least for the moment.